Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for the first U.S. Cattle Trace Wednesday webinar. My name is Callahan Grun, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Executive Director for U.S. Cattle Trace, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to develop and manage a nationally significant voluntary animal disease traceability system for cattle entering our food supply. Throughout this webinar and subsequent educational opportunities throughout the year, at U.S. Cattle Trace, we hope to provide our members and partners with the information they need to make important decisions related to their operations. Today, we're glad to welcome Phil Waller of Fort Supply Technologies to discuss RFID technology and the potential benefits for cattle operations. Phil serves as the Head of Commercial Operations for Fort Supply, a leader in precision livestock management solutions who enables beef operations to meet consumer demands for safe and sustainable food while improving overall productivity. As a courtesy, please remember to keep your sound muted and video off throughout today's presentation. Following the end of Phil's presentation, we'll have a 10 minute question and answer session where we will also be joined by Nephi Harvey, the Chief Technology Officer for Fort Supply Technologies. If you have questions you'd like to be answered throughout the session, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions and they will be answered in our question and answer portion. We are also recording today's presentation and we'll be posting it online following our completion for those who are unable to join us. Phil, thanks for joining us. I'll turn it over to you now for a presentation. Thank you, Callahan. I, uh, I appreciate it and we're very, uh, I have to say I'm, I'm very honored to be the, uh, the, the first presenter on the U.S. Cattle Trace webinars. Um, we, uh, we've been a, an avid supporter of U.S. Cattle Trace uh, back to when they were the uh, Kansas Cattle Trace. And, uh, and, it, and it's an important initiative and, and we love seeing it being managed by, um, by producers and, and you know, keeping the, the reins, so to speak, of that kind of information uh, into the hands of the right people and available then to, uh, to um, regulatory bodies as need be related to disease outbreaks. Today, um, Callahan and, and had asked me to talk about the the benefits, uh, the beneficial uh, aspects of, of EID. And although the initiative of the U.S. Cattle Trace is uh, is for disease traceability, uh, this technology is being utilized in many other ways across the across the industry. And that's what I'm going to focus in on today. And, uh, and, and I'm going to try to stay focused on the technology. Uh, by default, uh, I, I will be showing some of our technology as a means of, of demonstrating, you know, what I'm talking about with these advantages. And, uh, and I'll, I'll try to, to uh, keep the, uh, the commercialization uh, to a minimum. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Bear with me here as, as I work through two different screens. So as, as Callahan had said, we are a, a precision livestock uh, management company. And, and that's a, a key differentiation because uh, at the root of Fort Supply, we are a technology company. We're a technology company that's focused on primarily on the cattle business, but livestock, uh, precision, precision livestock management as a whole. What we do as a company and what many precision uh, man, livestock companies do can transcend across different species. Beef is, is our area of primary focus. And so when we look at you know, technology, um, this, uh, this road sign, uh, is is very uh, I think appropriate um, because traceability from the perspective of, of that the origins of that word let's say were really uh, around regulatory traceability disease traceability but traceability has really been redefined as the consumer continues now to to actually put a little bit of of, uh, of their dollars behind their their, their promises, uh, or excuse me, their dollars behind their requests for more information about the food that they're eating and, and how did it get there and is it safe? They don't necessarily need to know or want to know the intimate details about that steak that's in front of them, but they certainly wanna feel good 
about how it got there and, and what it represents that they continue eating uh, animal protein. And so traceability has really been redefined uh, also as consumer desired traceability. And uh, just the, that if they feel that they want to eat, quote, natural beef, well, then natural beef is, is traced uh, through the supply chain using the technology that we're going to be talking about today. There's also a transition in the ID technologies and EID technologies specifically, but ID technologies as a, as a whole. Um, we're transitioned, obviously, from visual IDs into electronic IDs. And even with electronic ID, there's a, a transition occurring um, to, uh, to, from the, the legacy low frequency EID to UHF or ultra high frequency EID. And we'll talk about some of the comparisons and advantages that, uh, that one technology can bring over the other. But then there's also the, the connectivity challenge. And when I say connectivity challenge, I include in there lack of connectivity because in the areas, the rural areas where cattle are moving, where cattle are worked, where cattle are born, um, oftentimes connectivity even via a cell phone signal is not always reliable or not an option. And so that offline capability, but then the connectivity of taking advantage of this emerging technology of not just the EIDs, but then all of the devices and software that really let you leverage that EID. And we'll, we'll talk about that today as well. So this is, uh, if you, any of you are familiar with the author, uh, Arthur Clark, uh, this is a, a statement that is, uh, I think, very appropriate because when it comes right down to it, none of us, for the most part, really want to uh, have the, the need to understand the intimate details of how the technology works. Um, I, I don't know how my cell phone works. I just know that it works. I just know that I have music and maps and email and all kinds of other information on that phone that's very useful to me on a daily basis. And for the, for, from my perspective, the cell phone is kind of magic, right? I don't need to, to really dig in and become a, a cell phone technology expert. And we don't expect, and you shouldn't be expected, to become a, a, an IT professional, uh, simply to utilize the technology, the electronic ID and, and related technology that's available to you. So what are we talking about when we talk about precision livestock management? We're talking about identification. We're talking about several different pieces. And I just want to define those loosely. Um, from from a, a fort supply perspective, these are the, the pieces of the puzzle. These are the components that are involved to not just take advantage of the benefits of electronic ID, but leverage that throughout the entire process of, of collecting and using the data that ends up being of value to you specifically, and then to the supply chain as your cattle move through, uh, through the process. Electronic identification is, is, a, is a part of everything that Fort Supply does. Um, there, it's becoming more and more part of, of, uh, of almost, uh, you know, in some segments, every operation uh, of significant size. And that's then the next step in, in leveraging that is how can you collect data more efficiently? How can you do it hands-free or even better yet, what are the autonomous data collection options where it just happens, whether someone's thinking about it or not, whether somebody is standing there watching it happen or not. Uh, and uh, we're, we're very, uh, obviously very um, familiar with autonomous systems in other areas of our life. Why not expect the utilization of those in, in the cattle business as well? And then just, you have the data, how do you leverage that data? How do you manage your operation better? How do you provide uh, data down the supply chain with your cattle to justify a premium price or to, uh, to get repeat purchasing from, uh, from somebody that, that values the information that you're able to pass on to them? And, uh, and that's where we'll also talk just about connectivity online, offline, and, and why you should be able to, to what you should be able to expect out of software in general that you work with. So what are the, the obvious benefits of EID? Um, probably don't need to, to state them, but um, handwriting is slow. My handwriting is terrible. And my mother still reminds me of that even at my age. 
And so it, hand, poor handwriting isn't a problem for me. It's just a problem for whoever's trying to read my handwriting, right? Um, we, can all, uh, it, we can all relate to poor eyesight um, being uh, compounding the problem of poor handwriting. But more importantly, paper records are very susceptible to the elements, they're very susceptible to time. We've all had something written on a sheet of paper being outside and it starts to mist or, or rain or we leave it in the we we'll leave it in the barn and and you know something gets uh, spilled on it or it drops down into the the floor of the barn and that's not all that clean right and now all of a sudden it's not legible. More importantly, paper records. I don't think anybody would deny that that it's difficult to compare them and sort information and and analyze data especially year over year so the the electronic ids and then the electronic storage and collection and storage of information uh, alleviates that problem even we've certainly all used excel and even excel there are better options available because with excel do you have the latest version of it uh, and the ability i'm not an excel guru um, I can certainly maneuver around through it as need be, but um, all of, uh, you know, creating a pivot table is about, uh, about the max of my expertise. And so create, comparing that data over year over year, there are better options for that. I wanted to put this up just to show simply how these different pieces of the EID, the devices, um, the hands-free and autonomous data collection, as well as then the software piece together to provide solutions um, and, uh, and provide those solutions really across the entire supply chain. Um, and, uh, and won't go into any detail here, obviously, because it's uh, demoing our products is, is, not, uh, is not the purpose here, uh, but is to just talk about the technology in general. And so when you look at at electronic IDs and automated or hands-free data collection, pushing that on into software that then allows you to utilize that information to, to manage operationally more efficiently, uh, manage with fewer people, fewer hours. That's where the, the benefits of EID and electronic data management come into play. If you can, if you can cut the time at the shoot, that translates into a cost savings. Um, obviously not everybody's gonna go home early that day, but then they can at least go and start getting other things done. And so costs, time savings is a cost savings. Uh, we'll look at this from two different perspectives of saving time and costs, but then also justifying value, uh, the value of the animals that you've collected that data on. And so this, this tr connectivity traceability, um, it should lead to profitability either through cutting costs or, or uh, an increased value. The uh, Michael Dell, uh, everyone's familiar with Dell Computers. Um, he, uh, he nailed it when he said that, you know, uh, our business isn't technology, it is about operations and customer relationships. And, and technology should help the operation um, and be more efficient, be more effective. And uh, by default, then customer relations are, are good or relationships are good, right? Uh, if you don't accomplish that, um, then, uh, then you as producers and, and others through the supply chain have uh, every right to be uh, you know, disappointed and, and a little irritated. Um, so when you look at, at advancing electronic identification, I want you to think of these two options. The, uh, we all, uh, I, I'm gonna age myself here, but I remember you know, growing up and, and we had the corded phone in the house and, and it was just a great advancement to go to the cordless phone. Wow, I can walk outside to the barn, I can go out on the patio, I can go into the garage and I still have a decent cell phone signal. But uh, then now we went through the flip phones, we went through all the different variations of cell phones to the smartphone. And I wanted to show this because this is really a great depiction of, of low frequency and ultra high frequency. The, both the devices do the same thing. It's just that a smartphone allows much more, much more functionality and flexibility than, than a, a cordless landline. Similarly, UHF allows you to do things 
above and beyond just animal identification. And that's important because if you're going to make the investment of time and a little bit of money to utilize electronic identification, and to utilize electronic data collection and management, then you want to leverage that time investment and the monetary investment uh, as much as you possibly can. And so when you look at uh, low frequency and ultra high frequency, both are able to be used for animal identification. And, uh, and I'm gonna give a demonstration of why that very, uh, hopefully a very succinct demonstration of why that is really valuable. But the, if you haven't already been told or realized or seen, ultra high frequency can be dialed back, so to speak. It's a matter of, of uh, configuration of the system and the power that you're sending to the antenna. And the power to UHF antennas can be dialed back to, to where they only recognize a tag about a foot away, similarly to the way that low frequency operates. The one advantage where then I, I you wanted to use that cell phone versus landline example, then it is the two basic uses of EID are animal identification and then animal monitoring. And when I talk about monitoring, I'm talking about monitoring the movement of animals through facilities, monitoring their health status without having to do anything except let them you know, drink water every day. Um, being able to, to monitor the assets that are in a pasture and a pen as those cattle go through their daily routine. The, the long read range of UHF allows that monitoring uh, functionality and the benefits, the, the several benefits of being able to autonomously monitor and collect data on top of animal identification and the, the process of managing and sorting records accordingly. So the, I, uh, I'm gonna pull up uh, just a, a, a graphic that we use when we talk about our, our value tracker solution. EID should obviously be used in conjunction with an EID reader. Um, there's handheld readers, there are stationary systems, we won't go into the, to the advantages or uses of, of those on this call today, but recognize that um, obviously that, that electronic tag in and of itself um, is nothing without being able to read the 15 digit ID uh, associated with it. Um, and I did wanna point out when you look at animal ID, a visual ID is going to cost you uh, a, somewhere between a dollar and a dollar thirty-five, dollar forty, dollar forty-five, depending upon the type of tag that you're using and, and the quantities that you're using. So people sometimes think, well, how do I how do I recoup that extra investment in EID tags versus the visual tags? You're really only talking about somewhere around fifty cents to eighty cents per head, um, because the visual IDs all have nice big numbers printed on them, the, the last four digits, five digits of that EID. And, and by default, it becomes a secondary uh, visual tag. I know that some of you may put two visual tags in with the same number. That's so if one falls out, you know what who the animal is. Well, if they've got a visual tag and an EID, one falls out, you still have the record of those two paired to each other for that animal. You go back, you see what the animal is, you replace the tag that fell out and you move on. But then the visual ID and collecting that, or excuse me, the EID and collecting that EID, how do you then leverage that information as, as the identifier? Um, the, uh, I'm gonna break software very simplistically into two types, data collection software, and data management software. And, uh, and I'll show you an example of our data management software and it's called FastHerd. When you look at FastHerd, there's so many attributes in there, it's so much information in there. When you're shoot side or you're collecting data on a, on a, a multiple uh, number of head and particularly when a lot of the data is the same, you're preg checking, you're vaccinating, you're treating, whatever it is that you're doing where there's some repetitive motion in there, um, data collection software that is purely for that purpose um, is a great time saver. And, uh, and I'll show an example of our, our fast EID. Or our fast, uh, EID. Um, in fact, I'm going to, you're gonna see a, a change up here in the screen because I have a tablet um, connected as well. And I'm going to pull up 
the uh, the fast EID and uh, and I want to show you the time savings that is associated with uh, that is appreciated by excuse me I have to stop sharing my screen I should have a audio visual technician here so that uh, so this moves moves seamlessly right but I hope you guys don't mind a little bit of a delay here I'm going to share my screen on this tablet. So um, this is just an Android tablet. It's a it's a ruggedized version that we carry, um, but um, the the Fast Herd app um, can uh, can be downloaded on any uh, on any Android device. We are working on the the uh, iOS version of it. Uh, anybody that's dealt with iOS uh, with the Apple Store uh, realizes it takes a little longer to get things approved through there. Um, so uh, every, Android usually ends up being the first. Uh, the first app to market for everyone. I'm going to see, I also wanna make a differentiation between the two icons that you're looking at there. When you see Fast EID and Fast Herd, Fast Herd has the little Chrome signal in it. That's because Fast Herd is an example of a browser-based application or a web-based application. I've created a favorite on my home screen uh, simply going through Chrome and, you know, the little, the three little dots in the upper right hand corner when you're in Chrome, um, you go in there and, and you've always got the option with a, a hybrid app or a, a web based app to put a, an icon on your home screen. Whereas Fast EID, it's a, it's a traditional Android app. I've already logged in. Um, and I, I wanted to show you some of the functionality that you should look for in data management software. First of all, connectivity. Um, you should be able to en enable the Bluetooth on the device. Some devices will use the, the hotspot capability similar to the way you'd connect to Wi-Fi, but Bluetooth is, is probably the more common connection uh, means at this time. And, uh, and simply click on the device that, uh, that you're looking for. It is now looking for this device that is sitting here on my desk and I am going to connect to it. Similarly, uh, connecting to scale heads, connecting to other devices um, can, uh, can move along that quickly by uh, finding them. It, if, this, if the firmware, if the software that, firmware software that lets two devices talk to each other, if the firmware is written properly, um, it, it should be as, seamlessly, as seamless as selecting the device and hit send. I'm going to now go into the uh, data collection mode. Um, data collection apps should be very user intuitive and, uh, and really allow you just to, to move around on the screen and do what you need to do. And I'll show you some examples using, using Fast EID. I, um, you can see the different fields. I went through that too fast. You can see the different fields that are, that, uh, are data collection options. For us, uh, at least at Fort Supply, when you look at these menu, the drop down menu options, those are managed through the Fast Herd portal. Um, and, uh, and then any updates that you make as a user uh, automatically comes over into Fast EID if you're using the software as well. But I want to show an example of, of identification versus monitoring. I am uh, going to scan individual animals. And so I'm going, to, I want to go into the single scan mode, but I also, I'm using UHF. So I am going to go to the power option. I'm going to dial that back down. That's just a slide scale on my screen. I dialed it back down to, uh, I dialed it back down to 33%. And I'm coming in here and actually, I'm going to retract that statement. <laughs> I put the ear tags about 10 feet away from me on the floor, all of them. I should have kept one right up next to me. But uh, if I were doing shoot side work, I'd just dial that power back down. In this case, I still am going to say I want to select a single ear tag. I'm, uh, I'm shoot side. I'm right up next to that animal. I, uh, you notice it, it did read several tags there because of full power, and I've got 40 some sitting on the floor over there. But it took, uh, a, in the end, it took the single EID that I was looking for and it registered it right there in the EID field. You may have seen when I was scanning the, um, or when I was looking at devices that I wanted to connect to, 
there were two the two low frequency ones there. Uh, this software can actually uh, recognize what wand that in or what device that information is coming from and register it as either a, a UHF or a, a LF uh, EID in the appropriate field. Um, our, our software, not all software does this, but our software actually in lieu of another visual ID, it will put in just the last four digits uh, of that EID. Uh, 15 digit code because a lot of people will use that as a, as a visual, but you, uh, you can see I can come in there and I can override that and put in, you know, whatever description yellow tag 157, um, any type of, uh, of a physical description that I want for that visual ID. And I am going to, uh, and then it, after I collect all that information, the, um, oops, sorry, here. It, after I collect that information, any of these drop downs in software, drop downs are time savers. And so if, if I am going to work cattle out of the top corral, I know I'm working cattle out of the, all of them are out of the top corral. Software should give that option of repeating information that you know is going to repeat. So pen and pasture location typically repeats. Um, the purchase weight. If you're buying animals and or you're buying cattle and you know that the collective weight is, uh, you know, uh, 4,500 pounds and, uh, and there's, uh, and there's five animals in there, then, uh, you know, that the, the average weight is going to be consistent across all of them. If you're weighing them all individually, or if you're pulling that information from a scale head, it should drop right in there to the, uh, to the weight for you. At the point that, uh, that the, information is everything is in there that you'd like you notice a tissue sample unit for anybody that's that's um, doing genomics testing um a barcodes the barcode scanner that that we provide to people will push that number right in there as well so now i want to show the difference between individual animal id using electronic id and and monitoring uh what i would categorize as monitoring measuring a bunch of animals uh, running through a gate, a bunch of animals in a pen, a bunch of animals that uh, in a up at the bunk and looking for pen inventory. I, uh, as, as I said before, I've got uh, a pile of tags sitting over here and uh, I held that trigger down for a few seconds and it, it captured 34, uh, 34 EIDs there. Think of how much time it took to capture the EIDs versus how long it would take so you, first of all, you've got to squeeze them down into at least a single file alleyway and then slow them down a little bit while somebody looks at that tag and writes it down. So uh, obvious advantage of electronic ID. I'm going to come out of that just, uh, I guess, as long as I have this still up, something else you should look for in software is the ability to create templates, to save templates, um, things like, um, I don't know if I uh, am going to, I'm not going to need purchase price. Excuse me. I, I'm not, uh, oh, the, uh, sorry, I, uh, I'm trying to talk and, and, fu and function on the tablet at the same time. I can move those fields around and remove or move the things down to the bottom that I'm not going to use and, uh, and take the priority data fields up to the top and, um, and, and therefore customize the, the software myself. That's particularly important for data collection because we're not all collecting the same data every time. You need that flexibility to make the software work for you. I am going to come out of that now. So just give me a second here. Oops. All right. I, uh, I am going back over to my laptop. Callahan or Kyler, how are we doing on time? About five more minutes here. All right. So just a, a couple of other things that I wanted to, to share with you is uh, so the you know, data collection software um, should just be very, as I said, very intuitive, very fast. Uh, it should speed up shoot work. It should speed up anything that you're doing and allow you at the same time to collect more information. 
And so then when you look at data management software, um, this is just some screenshots of our fast herd software. There, this is where you want a lot of flexibility in how you can look information up, how you can customize fields, how you can tailor that software to your operation. Cookie cutter software is, uh, is, is inefficient. You need to be able to tailor it to your operation and collect the information the, the way and categorize it. Name the, you know, name the breed options the way that you want to name them. If, if you have a particular uh, cross that you're always using, make sure that that's in there as one of the breed options, color options, sex options, all of that are, is customized, should be customizable through the administrative login in, uh, in a field. And, uh, and anybody that wants to go into any greater detail or in dis just from a high level discussion, general discussion, I should say, on anything we've touched on here, please get in touch with us and, and we'll be glad to talk more. Uh, it doesn't have to be you know, specifically a demo of, of our stuff in the way that we do it. But when you then, you have that information um, electronically, now you can send it up to the cloud. And, and that's really important because software is changing all the time. There are efficiencies to be gained all the time. That's actually one of the advantages of UHF over LF. Uh, livestock identification is really the only place that low frequency RFID technology is still being used. Everywhere else, whether you're talking about, we've all zipped through the, the toll booth at, uh, you know, at the speed limit, nobody goes through it over the speed limit and not had to, to slow down and hand money to the person in the booth like we used to. The, the ability, of, of uh, the use of UHF in all of these other fields in re theft mitigation in retail. We've all had our badges scanned at trade shows and boom, there's all of our information immediately uploaded uh, into the person's uh, database. And, and so the, the advancements in UHF technology as a whole are benefiting us in livestock. Similarly, um, technology on, on uh, software and the way that data is managed behind the scenes, the way that it's accessible is, is constantly evolving and cloud-based technology allows us to offer those real-time, uh, fairly real-time advantages to you as that technology advances as well. Technology should be platform agnostic. We can all start arguing over uh, Android versus Apple, um, you know, they, those are really the only two mobile options going forward. Windows uh, is discontinuing their mobile, their uh, mobile platform, their mobile operating system. And so from a, a cell phone perspective, uh, Android and Apple are, are really it. Um, but obviously from a, a desktop perspective, uh, being able to utilize, uh, you know, a, a Windows device and a Windows operating system, cloud-based software, uh, alleviates that per any problem there because you choose the browser you want. Chrome and Safari work typically best for cloud-based software, um, but uh, but you choose. So when you look at uh, at all of these pieces together, again, I apologize for the the value tracker graphic, but it, it uh, you you use what you have, right? And and the objective is higher productivity, justifying a premium price. And as that technology, it should all work seamlessly together for you. Uh, look for a connectivity guarantee out of a, a technology provider. Um, you shouldn't have to spend hours and hours and hours in repetitive calls and chats and emails to tech support to get everything working seamlessly together. Um, I wanted to show quickly here, if, if you'll tolerate just another minute or so, uh, Kyler and Callahan. I wanted to show differentiate monitoring versus animal ID. Being able to monitor are all the cattle that are all the cows that are in that 500, 800 acre pasture uh, that were supposed to be there, are they still there? That's only done through EID's capability of monitoring autonomously. Move, the monitoring the movement of animals through a facility like a, a stockyard, monitoring pen inventories. You can see on that feed truck, there's uh, some uh, some EID antennas and there's a data box in the cab. 
that is monitoring those animals, it's, it's reaching out about 30 feet from the bunk. Is it gonna get every animal at every feeding? No, but over the course of two days, you're statistically, you're likely to catch everybody in the, pan, in the pen. Three days out, you're gonna catch everybody in the pen. You can get weekly, you should be able to utilize software to technology to get automated alerts that there's something wrong, there's some animals missing. Um, similarly, uh, from uh, it allows health monitoring um, because the animals are monitored from a distance over the water trough, usually feed bunk, it just gets too, uh, it, there's too much commotion, too much physical abuse around a feed bunk. Uh, it works equally well to, to put this technology over the water trough and to measure the, the move differences in the movements of that animal day to day versus the herd and, uh, and recognize when their herd are injured and get a set of eyeballs on them. Typically 24 to 48 hours before uh, illness symptoms are, are visibly apparent. So I uh, just wanted to give those and you can see that an example of monitor or the alert uh, screen capabilities there on, on the lower right. Let technology, let EID technology work for you in your own operations so that there's a tangible benefit of cost and time savings and or showing more value for the animal. And then as a byproduct, you can share that information with US Cattle Trace and traceability happens without any extra effort by the, the beef supply chain and, uh, and without having to justify the cost just in the event that uh, an animal disease outbreak occurs. Because I think we can all agree if African swine, if a cattle disease like African swine fever or avian influenza hit the North American market, the US market, um, we don't want the sources and, and uh, to be tracked down very quickly. More importantly, for commerce to open up much more quickly in areas that were unaffected by, by the outbreak. That can be a byproduct of you utilizing this technology in, uh, in your own operation. So um, I, I did throw this in just to let you know, as UHF and LF are converging at points of consolidation, um, there, there are options out there to be able to read both of those frequencies in the same space and uh, in our dual tracker technology, um, our dual tracker system enables that. Right now, it's the only one on the market, at least that we know of, uh, but don't, I don't want anybody to think that now they've got to force a new technology down the supply chain. Um, you know, packers and, and feed yards and auctions where there's the two technologies are merging uh, can accommodate both with, uh, with, without having to have completely separate workflows and cons completely separate EID outputs. There we go, sorry, Callahan, I just uh, popped up a Q&A screen there and we'll open it up to the audience. And um, I'm also going to reserve the right to pull Nephi, Harvey, and uh, <laughs> in on this, if, if there's a, a question from a technology perspective that uh, he's more comfortable answering. Well, Phil, thank you again for your presentation and kind of the overview of EID technology, both as it relates to low frequency and high frequency technologies. Uh, we really appreciate that. I want to encourage everybody now for the question and answers, please type your questions into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you hover your mouse right there at the bottom of the screen, you'll be able to see that chat box um, and we'll get started with some questions um, for Phil or Nephi mm -hmm. if it's specific to technology. Uh, we did have some that uh, popped up right, that we had right before um, we started the, and I'll start with those. Um, the first question was, how does traceability benefit the rancher? And Phil, I thought you did an excellent job um, explaining from your guys' perspective, uh, but, but really starting the, the discussion on traceability in general, the difference between, you know, strictly disease traceability, which is what U.S. Cattle Trace is solely focused on, but really the, the overall definition and the redefining of technology as we're progressing forward, um, you know, as, a, as an industry, a uh, collective cattle industry. And I think from an animal disease traceability, you wrapped it up really well there. I think that, you know, the need for traceability benefiting the rancher it would, would, it would occur in that black swan event and the opportunity to protect our industry and hopefully um, utilize a, a system like U.S. Cattle Trace to, uh, as a tool in an animal disease response there. And, uh, the opportunity to be proactive in this sense and build a system in place that works for us for producers is really good there as well. But 
Bill, I thought you did an excellent job highlighting the uh, the uses of traceability um, within an, uh, within technologies such as your guys' own um, there as well, and operational efficiencies there as well. I thought that was an excellent excellent question. And Callahan, too, keep in mind that that even if as a producer uh, that that cattle rancher doesn't feel uh, the that there's still advantage for them to use EIDs elsewhere. There's a lot of people that next step down the line, whether they are buying cattle to background them and they've got a, a specific intent for where those cattle are going. Uh, it might be that they're, they're, you're going to sell them as part of a preconditioning program or into a, a, a much more uh, tight knit supply chain for specific traits you know, NHTC, uh, natural, whatever those traits may be. Um, the people that are organized, that are managing those programs, uh, all of those are examples where EID is being used. And you may find yourself simply being asked to use EID, to put the EID at tags in at the point of origin so that then when they move, make that next move, they can be tracked immediately uh, with the EID instead of visual ID because it fits into the management of the, of the next program or the next producer. That's great. Here we've got a question here from Frederick. How do you get the data from a specific location to the cloud server? Um, the it, it's going to depend on the technology, but uh, for example, ours, um, if it's one of our handheld devices, um, then uh, that with the app on there, um, you know, the fast EID app, it functions offline, even in the absence of a cell phone, uh, actually even our fast herd software, if you, if you go ahead and download it into the app or into the browser, uh, that you use Chrome again, is, we find works best, but if you, you open it up in Chrome, all of your data down downloads into the Chrome browser on your device, and you can go out of signal and still have access to all that information. You can enter information in single events and things that are occurring. And when you get back into, into range of your Wi-Fi or a cell phone signal, it'll automatically upload. So that's, that's really the way technology should work. You shouldn't have to make a conscious effort of, oh, check the box, I, I, you know, I uploaded my data. Um, the, uh, even the autonomous systems that we have, we can, we can enable them to send data via a cell phone uh, signal. We can enable them to connect right to, uh, to Wi-Fi at a facility, right to, uh, to your, your uh, cable-based internet um, at a facility. Uh, we even have some, uh, some units that are, are um, using shortwave radio. Um, because the cell phone signal is so bad. So connectivity should never have to be a, um, you should be aware of, of how it's connecting, but you shouldn't have to make a decision of, oh, I have to make sure to send my data. Um, now, the example of fast EID that I showed, one of the options was actually to create an Excel file and uh, an email. I didn't show that, but um, it, it goes back to the, the technologies to be user intuitive it should walk you right through it or do it for you without you having to realize that uh, that it was done. I hope that answers the question. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. Um, Phil, specifically, we had a question come in. Is When you're talking about low frequency, are you talking primarily about the half duplex or the full duplex, which I know can be both? Yeah, really, uh, my, my statements were around um, just low frequency as a whole. Uh, you know, I hope the statements that I made really are applicable to both. You you still have a limited uh, a limited read range of of even you know the the most you're going to get out of it. Uh, even with big antennas, stationary antennas is going to be two three feet. Great answer. Can low frequency historical data be imported into a UHF system without having to be manually entered? Um, for us, yes. Uh, I, I can't speak for all, you know, all software uh, systems out there or all databases out there, but um, we, tr we treat the two the same. It ends up being a 15-digit EID. In fact, uh, just as an example, our, our dual tracker system is an automated, it's an autonomous EID reading solution where it does require uh, we, we install the UHF components and the, the data logger and the communication method, but then we do work with the customer or, or one of the low frequency providers to put the, 
the low frequency antenna and, and uh, to provide the low frequency antenna and decoder. And we're able to actually just plug that low frequency uh, cable right into our com onboard computer within Dual Tracker. And it, it receives the data and sends it all out in a combined file. You can differentiate you know, which was which by which antenna, uh, which is which as it was it LF or was it UHF based on which antenna it came from. But it, I, all I can, I guess, say, speak to is from our perspective, the two technology, the two tag types are ultimately read the same. They're de the decoding um, functions a little differently. Um, there's different standards, programming standards for, actually there's different program standings to standards for a half duplex and full duplex. And then there's the, the programming standard for the USDA interim standards for UHF but ultimately you end up with a 15 digit EID and it should be able to be loaded right into uh, a software database. Perfect. I'm gonna ask one more general technology question then we have a specific port supply question. Uh, here's the comment in question. Thanks for the presentation, Phil. Very similar perspectives and development, um, including dual technology to those of Scott EID over in Scotland, mm -hmm. our good friend, Andrew Moxie here. As a question, do you see any merit in active rather than passive UHF tags? Um, the uh, coincidentally, Fort Supply started off with the concept of a uh, of an active tag. Um, the um, the disadvantages of an of an active tag, and Nephi, I'll let you comment on this too. But you know, the, the disadvantages of a, of an active tag is that you're going to uh, the tags are going to cost more. Um, you're going to have uh, now a, a sizable, you know, a, a sizable battery. There's a little bit of a power source on a, on a passive EID tag, simply so there's enough charge there to, to send out the signal when a reader pings it. But with an active tag, now you're going to have a bigger battery. Um, we just, uh, I personally wonder what happens, you know, how packers will feel about all of a sudden having to dispose of a bunch of batteries coming through. Um, and so the, uh, anything where you've got an extensively longer read range as a result of an active tag, uh, the cost has been uh, tough for producers historically to pencil it out. Um, Nephi, do you, um, do you want to supplement that? No, I, I think you're spot on, Phil. Uh, the, uh, the, biggest, the biggest issue is, is the cost and the cost is associated, it's higher because of the battery. It's also a little heavier tag in the year, so it has a higher probability of coming out in the year. There's been a number of co companies since we originated that tag uh, 14, 15 years ago that have come out and, uh, and it's always cost that, that drives the uh, long range tags, the active tags out of the marketplace. This is Malcolm. There's two other key points we need to express. We learned with uh, battery powered tags is that they have a very short lifespan to the limit of the battery and technologies to try to capture energy through kinetic energy devices or solar are just not effective with livestock. So they have a very short duration in addition to what was just explained. And to clarify, passive RFID tags have no power source. It's purely inductive. So there are no batteries in the passive tags, either low frequency or ultra high frequency that we provide. Perfect. That's why they're on the phone too. That's right. <laughs> well, Phil, I think we have time for one quick question, then we'll wrap it up with one last one okay. here. Um, quick question on the price of the dual frequency reader of your guys's. Um, and I wanted to get to that question. I'm losing it in my chat. What's the price of your guys's uh, dual frequency reader? So the the dual frequency um, the dual frequency reading solution uh, the the price can vary a little bit depending upon uh, what the connectivity option is the power option that you need etc. But in general, if there if we're coming in and installing it uh, right uh, right on top of or next to an existing LF system, um, the cost of the equipment installation and, and combined is, is going to be uh, right around the $5,500 to, to $6,000 range, or it might be a little less depending upon the configuration. Um, if somebody is starting, if someone 
uh, does not have a stationary LF system in place and wants both the, you know, the, the stationary antennas uh, for both frequencies, then there would be the cost of the um, cost of the LF uh, uh, antenna and, and, uh, and decoder as well. And, and that's just in general, Callahan, that's going to run, you know, it, it can run anywhere from five to 10 grand, depending for the LF pieces, um, depending upon what the configuration and the equipment is. There is one other option as well. Our dual tracker can utilize the UHF stationary equipment. And then actually we can connect. If somebody is just anticipates seeing a lot of UHF and a little bit of LF, we can, uh, they can save a little bit of money by using a, an LF wand reader that communicates up to our data box via Bluetooth. So it's kind of a hybrid configuration there. Um, so that, that would be, you know, then, then that's going to be somewhere in the, in between that 5,000 total and 10,000 total, uh, somewhere around $70,000 for, uh, for the hybrid. Perfect, thanks, Phil. One last question here. I wonder about data ownership because some manufacturers claim the data from their equipment slash software systems belongs to them. How mm -hmm. does this work with USDA tags? And I'll start this from our perspective and then let you kind of hop in, mm -hmm. Phil, on how it works with your guys' systems. From a U.S. cattle trace perspective, on a USDA 840 official tag, um, you know that that is a tag that meets the standards of a, a USDA official form of identification here within the U.S. Um, so that can be used within the low frequency, and there is one ultra high frequency tag that's uh, out there on the market that is official at that time. And so those tags can be used in any management um, way that they want to be possible, whether it's through a system like Fort Supplies or if you wanted to just participate in animal disease traceability um, with U.S. cattle trace, that can be work used there as well. Um, that the system, uh, through our system, it's strictly for animal disease traceability. So it'd be at those areas of commingling where there are readers in place um, today and the data ownership is, uh, you know, from our perspective is owned by us as a non-partial uh, non third party uh, nonprofit organization. Uh, through our mission for a voluntary disease traceability system there. So uh, through those tags, uh, it, it really has to do more with the official form of identification um, rather than it does uh, from the technology perspective of USDA, quote, owning the tags. That They would not be owning the tags there. So yeah, and, that'd be uh, accurate, Phil. Yeah, and Callahan, I'll, I'll approach it from, from Fort Supply's perspective or uh, a service sure. provider perspective. Data ownership is, is definitely something to make sure that you understand. And, and our position is that we are, you know, we are a, a, a tags, devices, and software uh, provider. Uh, we don't own the data. We send the data where our customers want the data to go. And some examples, and, and it can go multiple places, but one thing is, one place it's not going to go is, uh, is being sold by us. Um, you know, we have livestock, uh, we have units in, in livestock auctions where it goes into the livestock software. It comes up to our cloud simply by approval from the customer to go to U.S. cattle trace. Uh, we've got a, a, we've got units in, in packers, uh, an example of a packer where it, it's going into the packer system. It's going up to our cloud to then go to the state because the state implemented or uh, installed, you know, paid for the installation of the equipment. Um, and so we will 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 archive that data for storage purposes because the customer, you know, somewhere along in that relationship is a customer involved with us. But we don't own the data. We don't use the data for anything that a customer uh, doesn't tell us to use it for. And that Perfect. should be that should be expected uh, by uh, you know producer out of any other right. provider as well. Well, Phil, Malcolm, Nephi, uh, the whole Fort Supply team, thank you guys for joining us today and, and presenting some excellent background on EID technologies and some of the benefits that it can produce to uh, our cattle producers all across the nation. I want to thank everybody for joining on. A uh, reminder, this is a recorded. It will be shared out with everybody else um, here as soon as we get that recording turned around. I want to thank you all for joining and look forward to seeing you all next month. Thank you all. Thank you, Callan. Thank you.